Now, you may not have noticed it, but there was a little news item this week uh, about the impeachment of the president. Did any, did any of you catch that? Yeah. I see people go, oh no. In church, we're going to get that. You know? And the one thing that's true about that is that it has probably, every poll they've shown has shown, shown that people are already divided and this is only entrenching the division. So we live in a time of deep division and those bubbles. I like that word where you sort of, you know, within my bubble I only talk, I close out people I don't want to hear and I only talk to the people who sound like me saying the same thing. I'll admit I'm guilty of the same thing. It'd be nice if people would say, well, you know, when we come to church, we can put all that behind us. And then what did you hear? By the way, I preach not political sermons, but biblical sermons. So if you got your insert in order to fact check me, check out the first Corinthians, because that's what my text is going to be today. So I don't want to pass over. Much as I'd like to, to have Jesus call them, I don't know whether it's the new translation, you know, there's something about used to be fishermen and I'm going to make you fishers of men that had a ring to it. And I, the new one is right about fishing for all human beings, but just doesn't have the ring. So let's go with 1 Corinthians. <laughs> and when you look at 1 Corinthians, after, this comes right after Paul introduces himself. Paul, an apostle of Christ, to the people, he calls them saints, but they're, they're not in that sense of the word. <laughs> the saints at Corinth. And first thing he tells them, I mean like the first item of agenda in his letter is to say, I hear there's nothing but divisions over there in Corinth. You people seem to delight in having factions and schisms, parties and divisions. You argue with one another and I entreat you by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is not, by the way, a throwaway tag. He's invoking his authority and the authority of Christ. I, I beseech you in the name of Christ to put this aside, to have one mind and one heart and one opinion. And what is Paul doing? Well, let's back up a little. Corinth is a seaport city in Greece. And like most seaport cities, you know, there's a lot of people coming and going. And there's, there was a great red lights district right down by the, by the uh, beach, by the shore, the port. Ports are known for that. It was actually kind of a, there was kind of a saying that what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. So if you needed a break, you went to Corinth, blow off some steam. It was a place where people came from the east and the west, mixing of the Latin culture and thought with the Greek culture and thought all the merchants coming and going, and in this mix, there come people who have heard the news about Jesus Christ, and they have declared that Jesus was their Lord. Thus is the founding of the Church of Corinth. We're not sure that Paul himself found it, but very early on, Paul visits them, and he instructs them in the faith, that he sets them up. So he's kind of one of the founding pastors when he goes there. And he's now somewhere else hearing from Chloe's people, whoever Chloe is. Somebody says to him, you know, remember Corinth? They just bicker all the time. They fight all the time. So he writes down a letter. And if you're, if you're going to read one of the books of the New Testament, let's say this is going to be something you want to undertake for Lent, I recommend 1 Corinthians. There's a lot in there about communion, about baptism, about the resurrection of the dead. But he starts out, he said, we can't even talk about these things if you're always going to be at one another's throats. What is it I hear? There's a group that says, I'm, uh, I belong to, and he uses the same, you notice he uses the same phrase, I belong to Cephas, that is Peter. I belong to Paul. I belong to Apollos who was a great preacher. I belong to Christ. We all want to belong. You know, it's nice to feel that I'm not alone. I've got, you know, you're my people, right? I have a 21-month-old granddaughter um, that, we, that we watch during the week. She's a delight to watch her grow up. And already she'll go through, oh, Papa, yeah, where's Nana? 
down this in the other room. Grandma, which goes through, pop up, my dad, my mom, you know, she, these are all her people. She has a sense, not even two years old, that she belongs with that group and they belong with her. That's a, that's a deeply rooted human need. So what you do is you find people that, I like what you said, so I'm, I'm yours, I'm, I'm in your party, but it, or I like what you said, I belong to you. And Paul says, how can you say that? Was Paul crucified for you? Did you get baptized in the name of Cephas? What's he doing? He's getting right to the heart of it. These are rhetorical questions. The answer is, of course not. Of course not. Okay, then why are you caught up in all these personalities when in fact there is only one thing that is mindful for you? And that is whose you are. And it's not Cephas or Peter. It's not Paul. It's not Apollos for as good a speaker as he is. It is Christ. Because, as he says elsewhere in that, and there's lots of echoes of this part in the other parts of the letter, and echoes of the other parts of the letter here brought forward, because Christ died for you. Christ did not stay in heaven with God, but put that aside, became one of us, and died for us. And he uses that remarkable expression, the cross. Now, you may realize that the letters of Paul are the, are the earliest Christian writings we have. There were groups and, and communities, obviously there were churches in all the, all the cities, but the earliest things we have way before the gospel, Paul is dead before the first gospel is written down. So these earliest things, what does he find? We've got a diverse group of people. He'll mention men, women, Jews, Greeks, slaves, free, later on. All these things, so pluralism is not new to the church. And we'll find, if you look at his other letters, that no two churches were had the same issues. Even though they all proclaimed the same gospel and all claimed the same faith, they were all different. There's, in some ways, there's no such thing as the early church. They're all the little churches. So St. Bart's has its own feel and atmosphere and community, which may be different from the church over Holy Cross, or down in Fremont, or let alone way over in San Francisco someplace on the wrong side of the bay, <laughs> where people, you know, they do things differently. <laughs> that was true from the earliest times. So Paul is not expecting uniformity. When we read this, it's a mistake to say, I don't want any bickering because here's the way it is. Get in line. Shape up. Instead, he says, you're mistaken. Apollos is a great teacher, but he points away from himself to Christ. I certainly know that I, Paul, even if I baptized a couple of you, I didn't baptize you in my name. Right? I brought to you the good news of God in Christ. In short, he calls it the gospel. Here's a question you might want to ask people. It's a trick one. How many Gospels are there? You say five. Any other takers? Four. How about if I told you the answer is one? Ah, oh, Paul, Paul said, now, now it makes sense. Paul proclaims the Gospel before any of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John were written down because they all tell the same story of what God is doing through Christ for the world. That's the good news. Other translation, gospel. That's the good news. He says that that's the only news that we need to hold on to. That underlies everything. It is the foundation of who we are. In fact, we are the, the church or the assembly, be another way to translate, of Christians at Corinth. We take our name, we take our identity. Remember, I belong to, I belong to, I belong to. No, you don't. He says, you belong to Christ as Christ has given himself for you. And then he uses a remarkable term. And honestly, I hadn't, hadn't really noticed this 
until I was studying it this week. He talks about the cross. Now it is one thing for us to talk about the cross when it's become a universal Christian symbol since at least the 10th century. There were crosses before that, but it became, came to prominence at that time in terms of art history. But it's another thing to write about it while crucifixions are still going on. That is, wherever the Roman Empire was, for people who were not Roman citizens, but were outside the law, slaves that ran away, or people who dared to proclaim any kind of allegiance other than that of Rome, they would end up dead as traitors. They're probably guilty of insurrection. That's why Jesus died. What does it say over the top of the cross? King of the Jews. That's all the Romans needed to hear. That was good enough to put him to that painful death. While that is still going on and will continue for several more hundreds of years, Paul can talk about the cross as the way of life. Can you imagine talking about the electric chair or the gas chamber in those terms? We don't. I mean, those are horrific things. I don't want to be there when they inject somebody and put them to death, even if you feel that's necessary. And then to have this public display where people are tortured in the, in the crossroads as a, as a warning, a deterrent. This is what happens if you get out of line, says the Romans. While that is going on, for Paul to say, the cross is the way of life. That's crazy. And he says that. He says this makes no sense to one group, the Jews, and it seems foolishness to another group, the Greeks. But I don't preach anything but Christ crucified and resurrected. Because he says that is the way of life. So Paul's issue isn't the fact that people have different opinions or see things differently. That's the nature. In fact, later on in his letter, he'll talk about these actually as gifts. Somebody's a good singer, somebody's a good preacher, somebody's an evangelist, somebody's a teacher. You have all these gifts, he says. There are many and various kinds of gifts, but one spirit. And there's only one faith in one Lord. That's what he proclaims again and again. So we can be different. We are different. In fact, we could, we could go so far as to say, God made us different from one another. God gave us brains, which because I am who I am, I'm a white male of a certain age, grew up in Pennsylvania, blah, 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 blah. Those things will always shape how I see things, right? Whatever your culture is, whatever that, how you were brought up, the, the messages we got help to form who we are, our character, our individuality. To be a Christian doesn't mean that you go through the press and come out, you know, like hamburger, all uniform and packaged. We remain who we are, but transformed by the truth and love of God. And what's the illustration? What is the proof of that? That Jesus died for us willingly so that we might live. That's what he means in the cross. That's the essence of his message. And he says, when you set the cross up there, when you set <coughs> Jesus before your eyes, how can you owe allegiance in such degree to anybody else? How can those things get in the way? A reason I brought up the impeachment is because we read these first century writings from the gospel or the epistles and so forth. And as Karl Barth said, a modern, modern person reads the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Or maybe he says, you read the newspaper with the Bible or the other. Either way, what we know about God, the Bible on this side, informs how we read and respond to the news of our day. And this is written by a guy who had to flee for his life from the 
Nazis because he crossed them and said, no, you will not put the, you will not put the swastika there where the cross stands. I'll close the church before I'll set that, let, allow that to happen. He's mindful, as Paul is, that there is one overwhelming truth for us that transforms who we are, takes who we are in all of our various ways, all of our gifts, all of our strengths, strengthens our weakness, and that is found in Christ. He calls it the cross. And he says, once you see that, it sort of puts all the other priorities. We judge what we do, how we feel about things, how we respond to one another. When we love our neighbor, we love our neighbor because God loves us first. And this is how we show the love of God, right? When we make our decisions in the world, I have you for one hour. This is one hour where we gather together for communal worship. Not of me, not of my servant, not of Andy, but of God. We partake of the body and blood to participate in Christ's sacrifice and resurrection with joy. But after that hour is done, we go out into the world, strengthened, nourished, and hopefully with questions that need to be answered by our hearts and our minds and our consciousness. And your answer might be different than mine. God understands that. Paul understood that. But all of our answers are finally focused through the lens of the cross. We, are, we shape our understanding of the world by the way that God loved the world through Jesus Christ and called us. So he said, and I wasn't called to baptize, although he does list some people he baptized. I was called to proclaim that good news. And if I'm going to proclaim the good news, I have to tell you, you can't hear it if you're <coughs> in your bubble looking at Cephas or Paul or anyone else except at the cross. So Paul is telling them not to chide them so much because you screwed up. Which of us does not? How many times in a day, right? For some of us. But in order to correct something, you've gone off that way. Get back on the path. Remember what the faith is. Bring yourselves back into line with God's love and be able to proclaim that then above all other allegiances to the world. And how do we do that? By the way we live our lives. By telling others the truth when they need to hear it. By listening to the truth when somebody confronts us with it. I found this a really challenging passage. There's only what? Eight, ten verses. But reading it over and over for this week, it got deeper and deeper and deeper. To whom do we really belong? And in that belonging, is it a shackle or is it a freedom? He says that the way of the cross is the way of freedom. He says that the way that Jesus died gives us life. He says that all other things need to be measured by our identity. He goes on, there's a whole 15 or 16 chapters in this letter, but just this part. It's good to know that, okay, our divisions that we have today are old. Goes back to the first century. And even in the church, it's always been plural, pluralistic. It's always had divisions. It's always had quarrels. But the reason it has survived for us to be here today is because the truth of God will not be quenched. The truth of the gospel is told over and over again, re-experienced by us, and it lives even as Christ lives in us and among us 